Good evening, everyone. My name is Bryony, and I am an alcoholic in recovery, thank God, and I thank God for that every day. Um, I'm here tonight. I feel incredibly honoured to be hosting this event, uh, this bookish exploration of alcohol and relationships. Um, it's Alcohol Awareness Week this week, and uh, tonight we will be, well, all of you, by being here, are raising money for this amazing charity called AdFam, um, which you can see on Twitter, which is at AdFam UK. Um, we're going to be exploring literary narratives on addiction relationships. Um, we tonight, I, sorry, I should explain who I am. I, I, I just told you I'm an alcoholic, but I'm also a writer and I've written about my experiences of um, alcoholism uh, as uh, being an active addiction as a mother in a book called Glorious Rock Bottom. And I'm gonna read from that a bit later. But um, more importantly, tonight we have with us two incredible authors who um, we're gonna be coming to just in a minute. We have Douglas Stewart, who wrote Shuggy Bane, a book so beautiful that it won the Booker Prize last year um, about a boy's relationship with his alcoholic mother. And we also have Lisa Harding, uh, whose book, Bright, Beautiful, Bright Burning Things, I'm so sorry, I'm using the word, it's such a beautiful book, I keep using the word beautiful, uh, also explores the relationship between a mother and um, her son. And both of them I found incredibly moving and it's a real honour and I'm really, uh, I don't know if excited is the right word <laughs> because it's such a serious topic, but I am um, incredibly uh, grateful that I'm going to be talking to them. But first, I want to introduce Viv Evans. Viv is CEO of AdFam, and she is going to talk to me a bit about the work that the charity does and, um, and, uh, and, and, and how we can get involved. So Viv, are you there? I'm here. Hi Viv, right. So, look, can I just apologise if there are any Zoom issues to everyone? I'm, um, they've put, a, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that great at Zoom, uh, and I'm completely overwhelmed by being in the company of all these amazing people, which is a little bit. Um, but Viv, tell me, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, tell me about AdFam. Okay, well, AdFam was set up in 1984 by the mother of a heroin user and she could not find any support for herself. She was absolutely desperate um, with the stress and anxiety that the situation was causing for her. So she set up AdFam. And um, AdFam has been going, I hope from strength to strength since then. Um, and we're a national organization and we focus very, very squarely on supporting children, friends and families affected by drugs or alcohol. Um, so our focus is, our focus wouldn't have been on wouldn't have been on you, Bryony, but it would be it would have been on the people around you um, who were um, affected by what was happening to you. So that's that's what we do. Um, we run training courses. Um, we have um, we have some direct services, and we have an online um, support service via Zoom for family members. And I guess most relevant to today. Um, we're a campaigning organisation, so it's why I'm so delighted to be here and I need to say thank you to Tandem and to you and to everybody who's here on this Zoom call. Um, many of our supporters will have been to our carol concerts in the past. This is our alternative. We're moving from singing to reading uh, this year. I'm um, sad we won't be singing there. <laughs> no, me neither. Um, but it's... Um, I just want to say thank you um, and to the, to the panellists because it's only through speaking out about these issues that we believe that we can make change and have an impact. Um, and people who have a drug or alcohol dependency and the people around them, they do suffer a stigmatisation, shame, prejudice, discrimination, and we want that to stop. Um, we know from our work, our recent surveys that uh, you go through survey, um, that about 5 million people in this country are affected by somebody else's um, drug or alcohol dependency. And we really, and what we need to do is to be brave and speak out about that. 
because I think it's only by speaking out that we can create a movement and that we can make things change. So people um, with this, um, uh, with these challenges will be accepted and will be helped and supported by services and by society, um, society in general. So yeah, that's, that's what we do. And um, yeah, that's what that's what it, we do. <laughs> it is interesting, Viv. I wondered if you, because well, there's obviously been a lot of um, change in terms of destigmatizing mental health generally. Sure. And yet, Absolutely. addiction and yeah. alcoholism doesn't seem to have kind of caught up with that. There's still that sense that it is a, um, a sort of moral failure. Is that is that a sense that you very much get as a campaign totally. organization? I, I so agree with you. And, um, you know, I think we at ADFAM are learning a lot from the mental health campaigns. And this is why I'll say again, people speaking out, um, you know, mental ill health is now, um, it's, it's something we can talk about, something that, um, that, that is not shameful anymore. Um, and, you know, I've been around long enough to remember the days when I worked in a health promotion unit in the Midlands. And I used to go to all the factories at lunchtime and talk to the women about um, breast cancer and breast self-examination. That, that is now something that is all that is normalized. We can talk about it. Those years ago, we couldn't. So while our, our ambition at ADFAM is to be able to talk about it, to get support from every like, people like yourselves and everybody here, um, people who are courageous and brave enough to speak out about it, because we believe that that's the way that we can begin to make some real big changes and for society to accept that this is something that happens. Um, people should not be discriminated because of it. We want that to change. Thank you so much, Viv, and thank you for being here tonight. I am sorry that we won't be singing. It means a lot to me as well. Um, <laughs> Maybe yeah. next year, Bryony. Maybe next year. See what I can do. <laughs> but we are going to be doing some reading. Um, uh, Viv, um, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. I feel a bit... I feel a bit weird. I'm going to read from my book, um, Glorious Rock Bottom, which I wrote. Um, it came out uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I got sober uh, nearly five years ago now um, when my daughter was four. Uh, and so I was in active alcoholism for the first four years of her life and for many years before it. And I had assumed that uh, pregnancy would do for me what rehab and treatment does for many other people. I couldn't believe that I, um, that motherhood wasn't, I just, it never occurred to me that I would carry on drinking and using drugs in the way that I had before after I had my daughter and the strength of love I had for my daughter, I thought would be enough, but it wasn't. And um, the shame, the shame of that uh, kept me in that illness for a lot longer than, um, well, it kept me in it for as long as it kept me in it. And I'm really grateful uh, that with the help of many supportive people and organizations, I, I, am, I am sober and I continue to be sober and I hope I will continue to be sober for the rest of my daughter's life. But I um, wrote a book about my experiences, about my, the shame and, you know, there's a lot of shame, um, but uh, shame keeps us sick. Um, and I wrote it because I wanted other women who may be in the same situation to understand uh, that they're not alone, which sounds cheesy, but it's true. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit from it Very now. Mm -hmm. Mostly my hangovers showed themselves in my irritability with the people closest to me. My husband, my child, I am and always will be ashamed to say. I would take all the toxins out on them. They got my low moods and my lethargy while everyone else got to see bright, bouncy Bryony. I thought that their love was unconditional and that my moods could be excused by this. But I did not seem to realise that you could love someone unconditionally, but also not like them. I remember when Edie was about 18 months, taking her out for some lunch to a cafe near our home. I thought she could do with the fresh air. I thought I could do with the fresh air. The cafe was packed with other mums and their buggies. It was noisy and chaotic, like my hungover head. But I found a spot for us and set about ordering something healthy for us both, featuring lots of broccoli and leaves. The kind of thing that someone might see my daughter eating and think, gosh, what a good mother she must have. But my, my daughter didn't want to eat it. Of course she didn't. She was 18 months old and the things she put in her mouth were the only things she had any control over. A bit like me, now I come to think of it, although for very different reasons. 
I was cranky and hung over half the time and probably didn't give her the required amount of attention. But I had allied myself with the slummy mummy school of parenting and justified my behavior by telling myself that it was better my daughter had a good, honest female role model rather than one who baked and smiled all day long, compliant at all times. Edie threw the broccoli on the floor. I asked her not to. She threw some more on the floor. I started to feel my temper rise. If I could just get some broccoli into her, everything would be okay and I would win at parenting for the day. Why was she being so difficult? I tried softly to reason with my toddler. She turned her face from me in disgust. My whole body felt the shame of it. I got up, took her out of her high chair and took her to the disabled toilet where I knew there was a hand dryer. Edie hated the sound of hand dryers. They made her cry and cover her ears in terror. They shocked her, these innocent looking boxes on the wall that suddenly screamed and shouted at you if you went anywhere near them. The hangover had removed most of my patients and the broccoli incident had taken the little that remained. If you don't eat your broccoli, I'll turn the hand dryer on. Edie hid in the corner. Do you understand? I said fiercely. She nodded. She understood as much as an 18 month old could. I unlocked the door, took her back and repeated my threat, but still she refused to eat the broccoli throwing it onto the floor alongside the other wasted florets. I marched her back to the disabled toilet, locked the door and turned the hand dryer on. She began to wail and sob. Shame stung me like a swarm of bees. What was I doing? I took her in my arms and I apologized again and again and again, willing the hand dryer to turn off. I'm telling you this because I need you to know. I need you to know that this is the madness of alcoholism, that it does not always involve violence and injury and physical harm to yourself or, or others, that sometimes the harmful effects are less obvious, more creeping and insidious than that, that sometimes there are a series of actions that seem like nothing but mean everything, like putting your baby to bed without a story so you can crack open the wine a bit quicker, or losing your cool when your baby won't eat broccoli. But also, maybe I need you to know that you are not alone. That's the first time I've actually read that book out in front of people, um, and it's quite... Uh... <sighs> anyway, um, I am now going to bring in the fantastic Lisa Harding and Douglas Stewart, who are going to talk to me about their books about um, that are both about addiction and the relationship between mother and child. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Bryony. How are you? Hi, I'm Douglas. Great. How are you? And Douglas, how are Good you morning. both? Thank, thank you so much for being here tonight. So both of your books are, um, they're, they're, oh, I've just found them, Douglas, you know that your book moved me incredibly because I got you on my podcast to talk about it uh, earlier this year. And Lisa, you know, because I've fangirled you in the green room before. But um, I wanted to ask you about why it was important to you both to write about these subjects and, and how easy or hard it was. Um, Douglas, should we start with you? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for having me today, Bryony. Uh, and that was a beautiful reading. Um, you know, it took me about 10 years to write Shaggy Bane. And I think when I began writing it, I wasn't sure why I was writing it. Uh, it is a work of fiction and it's different to the narrative of my own childhood, but there's a lot of similarities. And essentially, my mother suffered with addiction from my earliest memories up until she died very suddenly when I was at school one day when I was 16. And I think part of the reason why I wanted to write the book was to, to make sense of a lot of that uh, and to memorialize it, not only the, the hurt and the pain and the loss of my mother, who was a, a wonderful, generous, bright, determined, beautiful woman, but also to memorialize a lot of her strength and her resilience and her, her dignity. You know, uh, the character of Agnes Bain has a lot of dignity. But also as a son of uh, a mother who suffered with addiction, I was trying to understand her beyond my mother. And fiction's a good, a good device for that because you have to understand a person in their entirety. As a woman, as a daughter, as a friend, as a foe, you know, as a, as a jilted wife. And, and of course, I was just trying to understand my own mother through writing this fiction, but I'd found throughout my entire life, it was incredibly lonely to be the son of someone who suffered with alcoholism um, as a child. And then also as an adult, there was never any way, I didn't have any outlet to discuss that with someone. And so I think in writing the book, I was trying to, trying to really sort of start the conversation for myself. Lisa, you're, um... 
your your book Sonia is the um I am going to call her a heroine actually she's the heroine of the book and her anti-heroine anti <laughs> um again you know I it, it's, it's the same actually Shuggy Bain I always people you know people mentioned that it you know people always say it was a very hard book to read but I saw it as a love letter to mm -hmm. Agnes mm -hmm. and similarly but I well I, your book I was reading it and what occurred to me is that it's almost it's like it's a it's a powerful piece of feminism, your book. Like it really, there was so much to unpick from it. But can you talk to me a bit about why you wanted to write it? Yeah, so my starting point for Sonia, she's really a composite of, you know, many people I know and love and aspects of myself, actually. And I started her, so she's primarily, she's an actress who isn't acting. And I was interested because my own acting career came to a full stop in that uh, facing the void. And I had to face up to my own kind of addictive personality, you know, obsessive thinking in it, a, a lot. Actually, a lot of what people have been experiencing in the pandemic, being grounded, being profoundly isolated and removed from the thing that kind of makes them tick. So that was my starting point was Yet facing the void when a highly charged, highly creative individual has nowhere to put that impulse. And, you know, a lot of people have written about the, the addictive um, personality that latches on to different things. And Sonia, she gets really high on acting. You know, she really needs it. And then when it's removed, that addictive um, personality latches on to men, onto when we meet her. She is, you know, she first she kind of turns to alcohol to try to soothe herself in her loneliness. It's actually a portrait of profound alienation as well. And I think that's something that a lot of people have experienced in the last couple of years. And we know that alcohol, you know, abuse and misuse has gone up a lot. So she is she's she's a study in, um, yeah, so many aspects of that psyche. So it wasn't just and I'd never say just, but alcoholism never exists in a vacuum anyway you know she's highly traumatized and she when when that place that she can kind of give expression to that is removed from her life she she's really in trouble and her little boy is only four and he's really in trouble and you know all about that you know having the little toddler you, both books I think really make state that claim that that the alcoholism addiction does not exist in, in a vacuum and there's a huge amount of empathy uh in but you know like i i i i i just you know but the characters you just want to i oh I, I mean i'm look i'm not i'm i'm, I'm lost for words which is incredible which is not great in a bookish exploration of literature and alcoholism but um did you both want to i i know um you know, you've mentioned, Lisa, that I read an interview with you where you said no one in Ireland uh, tends to be untouched by addiction. So I know that there is a personal experience for you. Did you want did you want to get that kind of empathetic, compassionate um, view of an alcoholic across? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's not that sympathetic a character she's pretty hard to live with and I know a lot of readers go Wah. she's she's like she's she's really hyper saturated and hyperbolic I think it's the theatrical element too but it's the disordered mind you know and it's it's what you do with that disordered mind and she's so just in brief Sonia didn't has no memories of her mother so for her becoming a mother was very triggering um and in rehab the, the, the nun asked her the question, is your alcoholism linked to becoming a mother? And she's like, wah, because, you know, she only has blurred memories of, of her mother and her mother died when she was very, very young. And her mother had, you know, I don't like putting labels on, on people, but had an inability to kind of sit with her with herself. So, um, yeah, and how many people are struggling with this at the moment in different shapes and forms, you know, it, it, it's very pertinent to have these discussions right now and to find other ways of coping um, with those feelings, right, of just not being able to sit in your own skin. Mm. Douglas, have you, I mean, I, I know you, you must get endless feedback about Shuggy. What are the, what are the, does this, it, does it, you know, it must resonate a lot personally with people. What are the kind of messages that you get? You know, one of the things that always touches me the most is when people say that 
uh, when they share their own stories. And I, I get a great sense from readers sometimes that it's, I might be the first person they've told it to outside of their family unit. And I think that talks a lot to what Viv was talking about earlier about the stigma of it, especially because readers often tend to be women and perhaps they've been suffering with, or a lot of my readers tend to be women and maybe they've been suffering with addiction themselves. So they come from a family that also has addiction. And like Agnes in the book, you know, I set the book in Scotland, as Lisa was saying, everybody has some relationship with alcohol, whether it's too much or whether it's way too much, you know. Um, and the men are allowed to drink very heavily, but it's when the women start to fail in that way that the stigma really comes to the surface. You know, Shuggy is a book that looks at the failing of men, looks at the failing of government, of a city, of Thatcher, and everything can move along until a mother fails. Mm -hmm. And that, when that happens, then you're really in trouble as a, as a family and as a community and as a society, you know, because I think women hold so much of it together but then we're not allowed to talk about it because it happens in the interior, it happens at home, it's not a public thing often. And so when readers come up to me at readings, I get, I really often share this moment, this very private moment with them. And, and that was something I wasn't necessarily prepared for, but I'm, I'm grateful for, if grateful is the word. Lisa, I sense that resonates with you. I mean, yeah, I, I absolutely adore Agnes. I think she's an extraordinary creation. I read her after, you know, my book was published, Douglas. So <laughs> we very different ways in anyway. But I, 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 I really, yeah, I really felt that thing of this wonderful, you know, repressed woman who who has absolutely no support. And um, and Sonia, you know, similarly has zero support and the men around her do absolutely fail her her father the man that comes into her life that there's kind of a coercive control thing going on you know she's very vulnerable I mean you have you explore all of that Douglas as well and you know you just think god when people are vulnerable you know how they're targeted as well mm. by by absolutely. by abuse abusive mm. bullying characters it, it's it's not always of course it's not always men towards women but you know um that's what we both wrote about actually and yeah I am um, the it's the isolation and the mm. lack of support yeah. would you would you agree with that sentiment that Viv was talking about that mental you know mental health there's, there's a lot of talk of destigmatizing mental health but addiction and alcoholism are this still as seen as a moral failure um in, in a way that we don't see say depression anxiety mm -hmm. now and um yeah is that something that chimes with you Douglas yeah absolutely um I think we've come a long way so I'd like to celebrate how far we're coming because certainly at the time where the book is set for me Agnes doesn't have any conversations about mental health or where trauma can go or even treating the the human as a whole the woman who has dreams and aspirations and a broken heart and feels stuck there's no conversations around that and I felt that very profoundly as a child um, you know, it was very much about will you stop drinking and will you admit you've got a problem and then take the steps towards it. And I didn't see enough from our GP or from our community about talking about the, you know, the deep depression that my mother was in and, and how sort of trapped she felt in her life. And actually Agnes's mother in the book, Lizzie, sees it as a moral failing, you know, at the very beginning of the book, she just says to her, pull up your socks, sort yourself out, get yourself back to chapel. Um, as though just when you say that to someone, they can go, oh, right, you're right, sorry, let me, let me get that together. But it, you know, there's so much stigma around the moral failing. And as Lisa was saying, men are quite hard to Agnes in the book, but I actually wanted to write the hardness as coming from other women because there are such high standards of what a good mother needs to be, especially in tight, uh, you know, working class communities of solidarity where you maybe don't have an awful lot of privacy. And so it's actually the women in the community that isolate Agnes quite harshly because they see this woman who has this enormous sense of self-worth, who might be disintegrating on the inside, who is definitely disintegrating on the inside, but they don't find her up to snuff as a mother. They, they know that she's coming apart. And so they're, they're really quite hard on her. Um, and they see it, I think also as a moral failing, they see right through and see that she's, she's stuck with drinking. It's time for another carol or another reading. <laughs> I wish we were doing carols. That sounds quite good. You got you go, go, Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> you start. I'll join in, Lisa. If no, you, you wouldn't want to hear your it. extract from Shuggy Bane. Uh, yeah. yeah. Douglas, will you read to us from Shuggy Bane, please? 
Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Thank you. Um, this actually comes from the heart of the book. Agnes, after suffering with addiction, after being abandoned by her husband, is uh, actually about to enter this glorious period of sobriety, uh, which is so, uh, you know, just changes everything in her children's life. But Shuggy notices it uh, in his body before he notices it uh, or can understand that the change is coming. Every weekday before the last bell, Shuggy's guts would tighten and he would raise his hand and ask most politely to be excused. Doe-faced Father Ewan would inwardly curse the little boy who seemed regular as clockwork. At first he would ask the boy to wait, just wait the extra 15 minutes till the school day was finished. And Shuggy, always biddable, would nod with a wince and sit cocked slightly to the side, looking to be in genuine desperate need. His wincing and his huffing would soon start to distract the other children and the father would acquiesce. Later in the staff room, the soft middled father would joke about what this miner's diet of boiled cabbage and mince might do for the clergy. The polite little boy, the one who clearly knew the difference between may I and can I, had been getting the cramps at quarter past three almost every afternoon of the school year. Father Ewan had come to set his watch by it. So Shoggy would spend the last minutes of the school day sat on the low toilet. He would take his trousers down only to be safe, but he came to know it was only indigestion. It was the burning bile of anticipation, the rising fear of what might lie at home. Agnes had gotten sober many times before, but the cramps had never really completely gone away. To Shuggy, the stretches of sobriety were fleeting and unpredictable and not to be fully enjoyed. As with any good weather, there was always more rain on the other side and he'd stopped counting a while ago. To have marked her sobriety in days was like watching a happy weekend bleed by. When you watched it, it was always too short, so he just stopped counting. The boy could not remember the change in himself. At what point the cramps died away and things became different was unclear. He could remember coming home from school one Friday in November and standing outside the house as he always did. Every small detail of the house told of what lay within. This evening, the curtains were drawn tight against the cold and the lamps were on, his stomach lifted in hope. Shuggy opened the front door a crack, just enough so he could hear the hum of the house. He knew what to listen for. Wailing and crying foretold a bad night. She would want to hold him in her arms and tell him bad stories of the men who had broken her. If there was the sound of country guitars and melancholy singing, then the warm moistness of shit would start to wet his underpants. To hear his mother on the telephone was not always a bad sign. He had to creep in between the front door and the draft door to listen very closely to the tone of her voice, push his ear against the cold dimpled glass and then hold his breath. She didn't have to be crying or screaming or slurring her words for the drink to be in her. It could still be there. It often made her overly polite, a false Mulgai accent full of long syllabled words and her lips would pull away from her front teeth and she would use words like certainly and unfortunately. These were the worst sounds to hear. Agnes would be mourning her losses, but still too far from unconsciousness. She would sit him down and tell him her stories, only this time she would be angry and not sad. With a packet of half-smoked cigarettes beside her, she would glide her finger through the phone book and make him dial the telephone numbers that she read out loud. 554-6339. Holding the receiver in his hand, the boy would listen to the chirp chirp and hope that no one would answer. He grew ashen as a voice came on the other line. Hello, said the stranger. Oh, hello. I'm terribly sorry to bother you. Agnes would nod her approval from the armchair. I'm looking for someone called Mr. Cam McCallum. Who? asked the voice. Cam McCallum, repeated the boy. He lived in Deniston between 1967 and 1971. He was a bus conductor in the East End, going between George Square and Shettleston. He had a sister named Renee, who married a man named Jock. The voice, confused at this oddly detailed information, would say, Sorry, son, there's no Cam McCallum who lives here. I see. Thank you very much, sir. I am sorry to have bothered you. Agnes would hiss with disgust from the front room and make him phone the next McCallum in the book. It was worse when they found who Agnes was looking for. The man on the other line would say, Who is this? I'm Cam McCallum. What do you want? The boy's heart would sink. Oh, I see. Could you please just hold for a minute, Mr. McCallum? I'm transferring your call. 
Agnes's eyebrows raised incredulously. Is that him? The boy would cup his hand over the receiver and nod. Right, she said, taking up her mug of lager and fresh packet of cigarettes. He would hand the telephone to her like an obedient secretary, and Agnes would arrange herself as if Mr. McCallum could see her through the line. With a fresh cigarette between her long fingers, she would lift the receiver to her mouth. You bastard, she hissed as an introduction. Hello, who is this? You dirty fucking who are master of a bastard. The man would hang up eventually. He always did. Agnes would take a long draw on her short cigarette, then a long pull on the old tea mug. She would stab the redial button on the telephone and smile as it quickly reconnected her. Don't you hang up on me. Don't you dare hang up on me. Who is this? Did you think you could get away with it, eh? The things you did to that young lassie, you bad bastard. There's not a bleeding heart in you, is there? Cam McCallum would hang up again, and if he were wise, he would wrench his telephone from the wall. But Agnes slid a finger through the phone book like it was a menu, looking for something to fill her hunger. She moved on alphabetically to the very next man who'd wronged her, Brendan McGowan. Now wait till I tell you about this stunner. She turned to Shuggy with the receiver crooked under her chin. Losing me was the biggest mistake he ever made. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Um, it's such a, the, the sense from both of the books, um, that real sense that I think children of alcoholics, um, uh, both current children, but adult children of alcoholics will get is that sense of the kind of walking on um, eggshells, never knowing, as, as their shoggy, never knowing what he was going to get when he got home. And I got that with, with, with Lisa in Bright Burning Things as well, that kind of, as you say, Sonia is so, she's so volatile, do you know what I mean? And I, and I, and I, I, uh, but I think it's, I don't, you agree with me, it's so important that we see complex female characters who experience these things because my own personal experience, when I read about um, alcoholism or, or, or saw it on television and culture, it was always a kind of like an old man on a park bench or it was a really cool rock star or a really cool cop who was like slamming whiskey, but it was never, it was very rarely a woman, you know, or a mother. And we've sort of touched on this again, but I, you know, how important was it for you to kind of, um, to explore that, Lisa? Yeah, and it's interesting what you say about the kind of, you know, the shifting sands. For me, a lot of the book has this sensation of speed and spinning. And that's, that's often the experience of being the child of an alcoholic. And it's actually a shared dream. I don't know if you know this, but in, they talk about an ACOA that often children who grow up around addiction, it, it, it's a kind of a PTSD, isn't it? Like you're like, ah, so this, this sensation of speeding all the time and not being able to kind of get yourself on, on solid ground. And S Sonia has that sensation within herself and her little boy is, so he's only turning five and he is really at that age, he's an extension of her. So he, Initially, my book was called Overspill because I was very interested in that generational, you know, overspill. It's a bit on the nose, though, so I pulled it back. And um, I, but it does fascinate me how, you know, the genesis of addiction is so young as well. And what happens to that little psyche in there, it, you know, um, in among all the, 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 the craziness. And my little fella, like Tommy's already fascinated with fire. He, he's, he's absolutely fascinated with kind of danger. He loves the mania and he loves the magic that goes along with it. Cause she is quite magical in a way that, you know, I think Agnes is extraordinarily magical. And there's a lot of beauty and magic in these women. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I wanted to show that too, but it's terrifying. It's terrifying to be little in that environment. Um, to be dependent on this it's like I, I think I wrote uh, uh, that she's like um, a fairground attraction that's kind of gone out of control and and the operators are looking grimly on and in, in a sense it's like she does that every so often she pulls back and looks at herself and goes mm. you know looks at her little boy and goes fuck um, but as you said Brian yourself like it's so much bigger than so it's not about self-control it's not about will we all know this now it's, it's a disease it's a you know, well, if you want to use that label, but it is, it's, it's a really powerful, powerful force. 
and and people need a lot of help. And I loved what Douglas was saying earlier about looking at the whole person, you know, the person centered approach um, mm. very important for the individual. And that's changing. And but again, and I've, I've said this before, and I'm just repeating myself in many different ways here in a way, but I, I think that that sense, and I think there's a lot of frustration which I encounter when I speak to children of alcoholics is, and, and certainly I get messages saying this is like, why couldn't, you know, I've already seen messages come up of people whose fathers have died of alcoholism or their husbands and they don't on, you know, there's that toughness of, of why couldn't they stop? Mm. Heartbreaking. Stop? Completely because, and it is hard not to make a moral judgment of someone when they can't do that I mean there's stuff I can I can still really you know um judge 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 myself on that but what I think both of the books and, and, and especially it was Shuggy is that like and I said this to you Douglas when when you came on the podcast is that sense of love mm. like that 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 even though she is in the grips of this uh, this awful illness and she does these things that would seem that are not you know that don't tally with someone who loves and, it, and it's the same with Sonia and Tommy that mm -hmm. don't tally that these are not the actions of someone who loves you and yet you know you know that it's you really get the sense of how alcoholism is something so much more powerful and you know it's like love isn't going to stop cancer it's not going to stop heart disease someone was saying the thing you know it doesn't stop um and it's yeah and I'm not really asking a question I'm re more just <laughs> throwing these things out for discussion really which yeah. isn't helpful I guess but um <laughs> but that's the sense I got the kind of com the complexity of people and the and the and as you say the generational thing and how Agnes and Sonia are both also their victims of something else you know and I think that's so important to see as well yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved Lisa's line there about a fairground attraction that was spinning out of control. It's so beautifully put. You know, I wanted to show that is Shuggy's burden in a lot of ways, and it's how he's different to his brother Leek. He actually does believe that he can have some control over the situation and help his mother in that way. And I think as children of addicts, we often believe that, or many of us can think that if we're quieter, if we keep a cleaner house, if we do all these things that our parent needs. I always thought I had to give my mother full attention so that she was less lonely. She was an incredibly lonely woman, you know, and, and her glory years were behind her. And so we take that burden on for ourselves as the kids and almost if we can change, I was always reading the room and, and Shuggy has that terror too, you know, and I wanted to show that about her addiction. Her addiction is incredibly complex because I think sometimes in literature, when you see someone with addiction, they keep drinking and they get the same result. Maybe they're a little bit sad, a little bit melancholy, a little bit destructive. But one of the, the real terrors of loving someone with addiction is sometimes you don't know what kind of drunk they're going to be. They can be gregarious. They can be the most wonderful fun. They can be self-harming. They can be really sad. They can be all these different things. And as a child, you entered into this chaos and you just have to cope with it. So it makes many of us incredibly intuitive, incredibly empathetic, really watchful. But those are also not necessarily the best ways to become those things because you're always just fearful about another person. And I wanted Shuggy to be that kind of kid, whereas his brother's not that kind of kid. Leek is a very watchful young man as well. He's, he's quite dissociated, but he understands that his mother's battle is her own. And Shuggy doesn't understand that. Shuggy thinks he can save his mother, that he can, he can do something to, to really help her. And that's the love there, you know, but that's also sometimes the wonderful context for children. They don't understand another world. I didn't really un understand that childhoods could be different until I became an adult and I met people who grew up differently. For me, I just loved the woman in front of me because that was all that I knew. And so I spent my youth trying to cope with that it's very interesting listening to oh, Douglas okay. as well sorry Bonnie, but I was just no, no, thinking no, no. I was thinking about the genesis of you know uh, I guess codependency in 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 relationships and how the child is is so it's so difficult for the child of an alcoholic to actually get a sense of themselves you because they are the, particularly the the way you wrote Shuggy and that child that you know thinks they're born into the family as the fixer mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to separate out and to become your own person because you just feel like your whole purpose on this earth is to save this parent that you love you know absolutely love um but it, it causes all sorts of trouble later on in, in your oh. own development and you know because you're, you, you, there's no space to hold the child it's it's mm -hmm. all about the it's all about the addict and I don't say that with any blame or Mm -hmm. anger 
but you know it's true no it's very true yeah how important yeah. was for both of you was writing your books in terms of sort of personal um i suppose healing uh as people that loved alcoholic or love alcoholics douglas would you like douglas. to <laughs> Yeah, my book was incredibly healing for me. I think I've been dealing with grief my entire adult life. And exactly as Lisa said, I, I have I carried enormous guilt with me over my mother's death, especially as my career, as I became a successful adult and I became a man out in the world. All I wanted to do was go back and help my mother who had no, who had very limited opportunities in life as this working class single mom in Glasgow. And so writing the book for me was a good way for me to try and understand the whole woman and not just my mother. But fiction, people wonder if the book was cathartic for me. And I think it was because it allowed me to look at a lot of trauma, it allowed me to process it. But the reason why fiction was important for me was because I decided not to write a memoir or to write something that was purely autobiographical. And I decided to make it fiction because it forced me to decenter myself from the conversation. And so it wasn't about what people were doing to me or how my mother made me feel or how, what Agnes was doing to Shuggy. I had to consider Agnes. And that was the greatest gift that the book gave me was to think about why men were the way they were, why Leek might be feeling how he was, but really to think about God. If I was the character of Agnes, how would she be feeling as a whole complete person? And that's the most healing thing that it did for me because, you know, I was on stage with Edward Louis in Belgium recently and we both sort of came to the realization we've spent our entire adult lives as young queer men trying to understand our mothers, um, trying to see them as complete people and not just as a son-mother relationship. And it gave me so much more empathy for the struggle that my, my own mother went through in the 70s and the 80s uh, to turn her into a fictional character. Was that true for you as well, Lisa? Yeah, and I, I so interesting, Douglas, because when I was writing my book, I wrote it in the third person, first of all, um, and I had little Tommy have, he had a first person voice, but then I took him out and I actually decided to write it fully in a first person voice inside Sonia's head. So that meant that I had to embody her. I had to climb right inside that head. And it's, you know, it was a difficult place to live um, for years, <laughs> but yeah, it, it gave me a great understanding of the power of addiction and, you know, the, the force that that's there. And as I say, I do have my own, you know, struggles with my own kind of I mean, it's not it's not addiction with a substance, but, you know, with different this thing about addiction, people, places, things, you know, but it's a it's a compulsive head that it's it's impossible to, you know, it's not like she she doesn't get any CBT and anyway, CBT wouldn't work, you know, for Sonia. It's like this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very it's very tricky. Uh, I don't know how cathartic I, I, I don't know, but it was certainly a big it was an act of empathy on my part and I felt like I absolutely immersed myself in 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 that uh, psyche yeah you I mean incredibly convincing I I I um it's a, a bit of a cliched question to ask if it was cathartic or not but I feel that there is and it's so fascinating that answer of uh, why you you decide to put it as fiction because as someone who's only written non-fiction and I'm in the process of writing my first novel and I realized that there's 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 a, you know you can put in so many more boundaries when you're writing fiction as well and it's it's, mm. it's that the overspill that you spoke about mm. uh lisa is 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 you know it's protective um are we are um coming up to our next carol uh and the at the end of my time with the two of you together so lisa is going to read an extract um from bright burning things bright beautiful beautiful bright burning things the, the beautiful yeah. book, bright burning <laughs> things um so when we next come back i will be with uh, uh a, a a wonderful ad fam creative writing competition winner so um i just want to say thank you to douglas thank you to lisa and lisa will you do a reading from your yeah beautiful book Brighton. thank you Bryony and thank you Douglas um yeah I'm just going to read something very short uh two little sections this is kind of when I say about you know inhabiting the the psyche the the the, the pulse the energy of her this kind of encapsulates her 
speed helps. I've always known this in whatever form it comes, running used to do it, sprinting, then amphetamines, anything that sped me up, helped me outrun the voices. The kick of performing did it, let me step outside of myself, my only awareness, the pulsing of blood in my throat, wrists, veins popping and dancing, swimming, fucking oblivion. Roberto taught me the feeling of speed behind a wheel, usually some kind of Ferrari. Granted, this old jalopy couldn't exactly break speed barriers, but it helps. The car shaking, loose parts rattling, the engine roaring. It creates an illusion of winning, of outsmarting the shadows, outrunning the curses. Anything that lifts me out of myself, even for a sweet blessed moment, even the blaring of the horn in the opposite lane, the car swerving to avoid me. My breath is caught high in my chest and I feel turned on like when Roberta would take me in a public toilet. I catch a glimpse of my son in the mirror, jumping up and down in his seat, rocking against the belt, testing its limits. So that's just a little... <laughs> glimpse inside her her head um that kind of manic feeling and um she plays games with Tommy a lot they, they have some beautiful moments where they you know they they they, they act out scenes together because she's she's very funny as well and they play a lot of spinning games and everything um but this is on the beach and just it's a little tiny scene between the two of them um, so they've just played spinnies and they've been, you know, <laughs> they're both kind of, their heads are doing that. And um, Sonia says to little Tommy, let's get our magic brooms and sweep away those pesky clouds. The two of us mime sweeping, swiping at the air, giant sweeping brushes in hand. Herbie barks at the sky. It's not working, Yaya, Tommy says after some minutes. Mr. Sunshine doesn't want to come out today. I think you may be right, Tommy. He overdid it yesterday. Oh, well. He drops his imaginary broom, kicks it, picks Herbie's wet lead off the sand. Come on, let's go, yeah, yeah. We can get some fishies and food for Herbie. He says he's hungry too. Yes, of course. Let's all go to the supermarket and get some of our favorite treats. As I say this, the thought of Tesco with its fluorescent lights flickering overhead, the long aisles stacked with all kinds of dead animals, makes my eyesight blur and my breath come short and sharp. A fluttering starts high in my chest and I rest my hand on it, trying to make the winged creatures settle. I can do this. It is necessary. It is normal. I must do this. I'm grateful for the rain that has decided just at this moment to fall on us. It dampens the wings, weighs them down. My boy raises his face to the sky and licks the drops as they fall. Will there be a storm, Yaya? He loves storms like me, loves the thrill of thunder, his tiny body rocking to the bass notes, his eyes fixing on the flashes of lightning. I think of the early summer storm of three months ago when the two of us flew out the front door to the green and danced barefoot, bodies swaying, chasing the flashes, willing the lightning to come find us. Herbie stayed by the back door whining. Last one to the car is a pooper, I say, running in my bare feet, flip-flops and hands. Pooper scooper, he sings, laughing. In the car, we play the game of colours. Any colour we see, we have to describe in terms of something else. Tommy started this one himself accidentally when I asked him to name all the colours he could see inside and outside the car. He started by saying the colour of snot and grasshoppers, yuck, the colour of the sea on a sunshine, sunshiny day, the colour of the sky on a cloudy day, the colour of Herbie's eyes, the colour of rain, the colour of Yaya's hair, the colour of Yaya's happy. What he is actually seeing as he says this, I can't imagine. What is it, Tommy? What do you see? Is it that seagull? The colour of ice cream, he says. And I just to say that section, I just wanted to kind of, um, yeah, that, that despite, you know, the blurring of fantasy and reality there and where the, the, the for the child, the um, what's real, what's not. And that's, that often happens in the alcoholic environment. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's um, a fantastic book. Um, Lisa and Douglas, uh, and the, I know that the uh, organisers have been putting uh, links to buy their books in the um, in, in the in the chat. Um, now, I would like to introduce the lovely Kathy McCulloch. Hello, Kathy. Hello. Hi. Good evening, Kathy. Um, Kathy won last year's Adfam Creative Writing Competition. 
Um, congratulations, Kathy. Can you tell me a bit about what you what you wrote and what the inspiration behind it was before you read it to us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is the first time I've obviously done anything like this and listening to you guys this evening has been amazing and just, you know, just highs and lows. Um, but I have made notes because it's my first thing. So um, AdFam last year put out the writing competition and through social media, I started to think, hmm, maybe I can, maybe I should um, do something, put pen to paper, write how I'm feeling. Um, and it allowed me the opportunity to try and understand my situation. Um, to begin with, I felt guilty, like I was selling out my loved one um, and not protecting them by talking, by actually doing it. But I thought it was important and it was time to, um put my put my part of the story out there and can not I ask, be I don't I don't want to interrupt you but I want to know would you talk a bit about what your situation was um do you yeah know? so um it's still ongoing it's unfortunately a family member who struggles with alcohol um has done for a long time um it's come to a head maybe five four, three, four years ago, um, you know, up and downs every day is something. It might not be a full on alcohol day, but there's always negatives because of it, the family situation, um, you know, there's always debate and talk and it always takes over every situation. The happy memories always have those in your, he in your head, what's going to happen now um and we were able to send them to rehab um try and save them help them um but you know it just it's always it's always there so i thought it was important to put um to to put my story out there um, not as a victim but as a survivor just so i could be heard and tell my truth which reading through the comments this evening is i think everyone's in the same situation and it's important to have a, a start open talking about it because these illnesses thrive in um they thrive in the dark they thrive in they thrive in vacuums of, of silence don't they yeah yeah as, my... as you've all said this evening it's not just that person it's the whole family mm. um and, and what um, does, can i ask you when you hear um you know people like douglas and lisa talking about that and, and writing about that how does that feel to you um what lisa was saying about the fantasy and the reality um for me it was i have a wonderful my sister is incredible we support each other all the time but we've always you know laughed in a we've always said you know no one would believe our story it's so unreal you know you've got the um you've got these ridiculous stories, you've got the sad stories, just it's so unbelievable. And that's a fantasy and reality um, that it is truth. It is our truth. And our truth is different to my parents' truth um, and the reasons why they drink. Um, and just listening to Douglas, you know, it's just these are works of fiction but from a non-fiction perspective. Um, can you tell me, would you want to read your poem? Yeah, more than happy to. And then we can talk a bit about it afterwards. Yeah, that would be lovely, thank you. So, um, right, here we go. I sit here opposite you, my heart sinks. Your silence and remorse is screaming at me. It tells me that even though this time it has been months, not one single sip was enjoyed. I cannot even begin to imagine how you feel about yourself and what you have done to us again. I cry as you promise us this will be the last time. No more chances. Sorry, did you? Yeah. Um, did you get any of that? I just... Yeah, okay. Um, 
not believing you for a second, but wondering how you can truly believe in yourself. Despite all the lies and the pain you cause, please listen to my words, they are from the heart. Your disease is our disease and we choose to stand by you. Don't say sorry, this is not your fault. It was always going to be when, not if. Understand, you have not failed. This wasn't about failing. This is about living and if you want to, you can choose to live. We cannot choose that for you. We cannot control your thoughts or your behavior, but trying to control us just shows how out of control you have become. But don't forget, you do have the tools to control the beast. So look up and look forward. Please do not stay in the dark twisted past. Please give us time to mourn, to breathe, to heal. How can you mourn someone when they aren't gone? Because you mourn the person everyone loved and respected, the person who you lost all those years ago. You mourn the person who you can still see deep beneath the surface within the pools of sadness as you look into their eyes. I wonder why this happened to you, my favorite person in the entire world. Each day is different, but each day is the same. Each day we hold our breath. Is today the day the never ending suffocating grip squeezes a little harder as you fight not to let it pull you under again? The anxiety is beating in my chest, my breaking, my heart breaking again. The sadness, the tears, the overwhelming need to just breathe fresh air, clean air, fresh hope. We believe in you, please believe in yourself. How different our lives could be, how different our focus should be, but we cannot live a life full of what ifs or maybes. You made us our strongest when we were feeling our weakest. You raised two children who despite everything have not broken. It has united us as a family in a bond that is so special that we lift each other up even when we feel like breaking. Shall we choose to be happy? Shall we choose hope and not anger? Shall we not let this disease rot our souls? Let us live in the light and not in the dark. Take my hand, please. Hold it tight. Never forget we are still here, still by your side, still fighting this battle with you. Even if you feel that we are fighting you, we are not. We are fighting to save you. Kathy, that's absolutely, utterly beautiful. And there was a line in that, which I think kind of sums up the whole theme of, of the evening and, um, and, 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 and what we're here to, and the work that ADFAM do, which is your disease is our disease. Um, and uh, how did it feel reading that out, Kathy? Yeah, it's, I haven't actually read it for a while now. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a love letter, isn't it? It's a love letter to my dad telling him, please, you know, we are still here. And it hurts a lot. Every day it hurts. Um, but it, I do feel proud of myself for writing. I do feel proud of myself for coming forward and actually, you know, giving that hope that maybe someone else will hear that and not and feel a little less alone in the world like I have done by sit, like speaking to other people hearing you guys tonight so many different ways you know it's this as I think you said Bryony there's so you you think alcoholics um people addicted to drugs it's celebrities it's this person on the bench and it's not it's everyone it's your mum, it's your dad, it's your brother, your sister. And it just, yeah, I'm proud of what I wrote. And I think everyone on this panel tonight should be proud of what we've done because it opens up a forum for people to know that it's not taboo. It is real life and people need to know it's not something that can't be talked about. Kathy, um I think your dad, if he had, has, it would be incredibly proud of you. Um, has he, have you read that to him or? Um, in a moment of anger, I threw it at him, but he's read it, yeah. And it's, it, we, I don't know if I've talked about it with him. Um, it's, I'm proud of what I wrote and 
being chosen as the competition winner, but it's a, you know, it's a catch 22. I'm proud of something for a really sad reason. And it, and even though I can talk about it with you, I don't talk about it. I have my best friend and my sister and my husband, and that's it. Um, but just to be able to, you know, have this opportunity to speak to you guys tonight is just so special. You're pretty special. You don't <laughs> let me tear up. Um, there's, you know, like I feel like there's a lot of love in this in this Zoom room tonight, and um, and a lot of compassion. And I think that's what is generally lacking in um, society. And if we could yeah. amplify what has been said in this room and what has been felt and what has been read out, um, and transfer that to the wider population, wow, the world would be a better place um and 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 you know and i think it is you know this is an illness that affects as you, as as uh, as you say not just the person suffering from it but everyone around them and it it has real and long lasting effects and we you know we often hear that it's a family illness you know it's a hereditary thing and mm. you know i think listening to your poem and listening to and and, and having read Lisa and Douglas's books, you, you really see that sort of intergenerational and how we are all, um, you know, it's it's an illness that, you know, you said you're a survivor, you know, and I, and I think that I'm not a victim, but it does, you know, it does harm so many people. And I, and I wish we could talk about it um, generally as openly as we've been talking about it tonight. Um, yeah. Kathy, I'd like to thank you. I really, uh, I hope you're going to stay in touch. Um, I hope I want, so too. Thank I want to hear more of your your work. And um, everyone, you know, everyone, like um, when I was reading Shuggy Bane last, it was about, it was a year ago. And I was like, I need to just send this guy a Twitter message because it made me sob. Um, but it made me feel so much love and I and I think I've told Douglas that now like 800 times mm -hmm. and Lisa when I was reading um, your book it, it was it was you know Sonia is a complicated and often unlikable character but I felt that there was a lot of me in Sonia and it was beautiful and really important to be able to see that on the page and to feel it and to feel less alone um, so I want to thank uh, I want to thank Lisa Harding and Douglas Stewart for coming and talking to me tonight. Kathy, thank you so much for reading out your beautiful poem and having the courage to do that because I know that won't have been um, an easy thing to have done. Like I think before in the in the in the in the online green room, how we all have <laughs> imposter syndrome. Um, but yeah. it was it was beautiful and yeah, um, so thank you. Thank I you. think that it's. Sorry, can I just say, like, I think as everybody knows that's here tonight, that, um, you know, it's the one thing that we need to do uh, with like ADFAM and all the other charities is that we need to recognize that it needs proper care and treatment and that families do need that support as well. And that's why, like, you know, we're not overlooked or forgotten and people like ADFAM and doing events like this give people that voice. So it's just it's just been brilliant. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you to Adfam for everything you do, to Viv Evans for coming along and talking us to us tonight. Um, there are you know a number of organizations that you can get in touch with. Uh, I have them, I'm, I'm getting my print out here. Um, you can follow Adfam on Instagram at Adfam UK and on Twitter at Adfam UK and you can learn more about Adfam by going to their website which is just adfam.org.uk and there are you know as a lot of different organisations and other organisations you can get help with um, which are all on Adfam's um, website as well, Al-Anon, Drinkline, Drug Fam, Families Anonymous, National Association for the Children of Alcoholics, NACOA, Scottish Families Affected by Alcoholics and Drugs. I could go on. There are so many amazing, amazing organisations out there. Um, and I want to thank everyone for, um, for, uh, for the work they do. Thank you again to Douglas and Lisa for the brilliant writing they've done and Kathy for the amazing poem she's written. But also, I just want to finish by thanking you guys for coming here and for all of your lovely um, 
feedback and messages and, and, and really brave and open, honest messages in the chat box. And finally, last but not least, I want to thank everyone at Tandem Collective for putting on this absolutely awesome event. Um, I wish we were all in a room together because I feel like I need to have some hugs and a few tears now. But um, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and know that you are not alone. <laughs>